Good morning and welcome. I'm excited to have Donna Burton, more affectionately known as Donna the Astronomer, back to talk about what's in the skies, particularly in April, what happens with Easter and all those sorts of things. So welcome Donna and thank you for your time. Thanks Faye, thanks for having me. There's a lot happening in April in the skies, particularly with Easter and all this sort of thing. Lots of other things as well. Please explain what happens with the moon and Easter and all those sorts of things in April. Okay, so you might wonder why last year um, Easter was in March. This year it's in April, so it can vary between March around Anzac Day. Unfortunately, with no offence to our Christian friends, it actually has got nothing to do with what happened in Jerusalem some 2,000 years or so ago. It's all got to do, and it's actually predetermined long before that. So Easter is actually the Sunday that's closest to the full moon after the March equinox. So the March equinox happened in, back in March, obviously. For us, it symbols autumn. Northern yes. Of course, it's the beginning of spring, so that's how they see it. And the full moon after that, the closest Sunday to the full moon after equinox, we celebrate Easter on. And that's why it's really intriguing because all the school holidays always seem to coincide with the full moon because they're all based upon monthly, you know, three months from Easter. Right. Okay. And our school holidays are like kind of crazy, but everything around it revolves not so much about anything else. And this happens, the moon and the moon also has a lot to do with the Paschal moon being for Passover and Ramadan. So it's, and Ramadan, of course, is a new moon around the same time. But these are all determined by what the moon is doing for the three major world religions, rather than actually celebrating actual events in time and history. That's, that's interesting. So you look to the sky just to get an understanding of it. I always look to the sky. This, you know, I take a little bit more notice of it now that I've been having conversations with you over a period of time and noticing more about what the sky looks like and what's in it, particularly at night. Explain to us what actually happens in April that is is it different to any other month of the year or is it similar or the same? Well, I tend to like April a lot because daylight saving ends on the 3rd of April. Oh, and then we're all on the same time zone and I don't actually have to think, even remember my universities in Queensland, I live in New South Wales, it gets a bit complicated. So yes, we're back on normal, normal time, which <laughs> I personally find good. I know other people don't, but that's my personal thing. But also the Milky Way is incredible. It really is the season of the Milky Way. You've got the Southern Cross and the two-pointer stars rising early in the evening. And as you follow them across the sky until the scorpion comes up, which is where our galactic centre is, you've got just this incredible view if you've got a dark sky sight to get. So we get past the bright lights of the moment. If you go outside at the moment after dark, say you go out around 9, 10 o'clock local time, you can see the Southern Cross and the pointers in the, in the Southern sky and you can see emu in the sky. So emu in the sky is really important, particularly across many of our Indigenous cultures. Um, as this time of year, it's like a calendar. I was going to say, what's, what's the meaning of the emu in the sky? So if you can find, let's start by actually looking at what we're looking at. So if you can find the Southern Cross, Yes. Right, which most of us hopefully can do, by, yes. even if we have to get a um, compass to help us find south. Um, <laughs> That'd be me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you, you can find the cross because it's the smaller, brighter of the three. There's actually three crosses in the sky in the general vicinity of the Milky Way and the Southern Cross. So you've got the Southern Cross is the lowest one and right. it's the brightest one. But more importantly, it has its two little mates following it around called the pointer stars now if we're up in queensland or the northern territory the southern cross represents a stingray so uh, these are some challenges for you Faye, as well as our other listeners to go out and see if they can find these stories in the sky so it's a stingray and the two pointer stars are two sharks that follow it all the way across the sky all, all the time if you're in other parts of the country like down victoria the burong people they see it as a um very naughty possum Get, oh. who's got himself trapped in a tree after he stole the e-music. Right. I will tell you something that's really, you know, <laughs> if you're a possum, you're not exactly big. If, you're, if you've got an emu's egg, I don't know if you've ever seen an emu's egg, they're right? rather but large. they're quite large. Mm. So the one thing you need to do 
the skill you need to have if you're going to steal emu eggs is you need to be able to run really, really fast. Because yes. emu can run really, really fast. And he gets a little bit upset when you nick his eggs. So <laughs> poor old poor old possum stole the egg and then had to climb the tree. And he's kind of stuck in that tree now forever. And his little nose is the is the star in the Southern Cross and his tail wraps around. Okay. Okay. And if you live in, say, South Australia, the cross represents an eagle's print. So think of an eagle's foot, the three legs of the eagle. Yeah. Okay. And um, he's sitting there, that's it, and underneath where there's a dark area, which we see as Emu's head, or we call the coal sack in Western culture. Basically, the head of the hunter, two pointer stars are the throwing stick. Right. Um, ready to come and get him. <laughs> so you've got all of these things. So the coal sack is eerie. You've got the throwing stick. And so each part of the country has a story that represents what they have in their in their areas to tell the stories of the ground. And that's kind of what the um, Milky Way represents. It represents things that are happening here on the ground are also happening in the sky. So it's because like they're... a river in the sky with the stars being the campfires. Yeah. And the um, haze being the smoke, or the white stuff in the Milky Way, the stardust and all of that being the haze from the fires. Right. So it's all an explanation. Okay. It's quite interesting. I never, I, I, well, I didn't know any of that. Didn't know the Southern Cross had so many different stories in different states of, of Australia and worldwide that would be as well, wouldn't it? Yeah. And there's different cultures in the world wide. In Chile, it's the, um, where we see an emu, they see a llama. Right. Okay. And so in New Zealand, when, they see one of their big birds. Well, when, you, when you're looking at the night sky now, or when we're looking at the night sky, we're going to look at things in a different way and have a, a, a better understanding or create more of a curiosity of what is actually out there and what is the story of a particular star or a comet, you know, the Milky Way. Is the Milky Way the same story all across the world or is it so different? The Milky Way is our galaxy. It's called the Milky Way from the Egyptian times because it looks like milk. Think of Cleopatra and her bar bathing in milk all the time. Right, yes. Um, but so the Milky Way has that milky look about it. Right, okay. Um, unlike the children who tell me that it's being named um, the Milky Way after the chocolate, it's kind of the other way around. <laughs> I got so the, the giggles at a show one night when this child says, that's what, that's, that's what the chocolate's name, or what do they say? They say the Milky Way is named after the chocolate. <laughs> And I think well, they thought Mars bars must have been named after Mars. Oh, but right. That's okay. They're only four years old, so they're allowed to think such things. And that's creativity and that's imagination. Isn't that wonderful? And that's what it's all about because each culture across the world have made up these stories of what they see. And so they're to explain their own story. So you think of the signs of the zodiac. Yes. The um, 12 or these days 13 signs from the ancient Greeks, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans and all of that, that we see like the most prominent one at the moment rising in the east is Leo. To us, it looks like an upside down question mark or a sickle. Um, but if you imagine yourself in the northern hemisphere, you can actually see the lion, the king of the beast. I have to look so, at that in the night sky yeah. then. I you have, have to, to look at curious. it in the night sky. It's like an upside down question mark. So you go outside, you look to the, to, I was going to say, to the north of east. Right. Right, not to the south of east. And there's a really super bright star. It's called Regulus. Regulus means prince or little king, four royal stars of Persia. Right. Um, along with Aldebaran, the eye of the bull, which you can see towards the west in Taurus. Antares, which comes up much later, which is the heart of the scorpion. And Formal Help, which is much further towards the south. And um, was one of the earliest stars to have a planet found around it in modern times. So when we look up at the sky... And we have no idea. There's so many stories to be told about yeah. what's there and each star or whatever, the Milky Way, the, the Southern Cross, the Iron Pot, all those sorts of things all have stories to them. Hmm. It creates more of a curiosity. And I think, you know, kids growing up should know this stuff so that they can enjoy when they go out into the sky in, you know when it's dark and they can go out and have a look at the sky and say that's that's that that's that that's that that and, sounds and it's like in, fun. in modern folklore as well the bright star right above your heads at night because there are no planets visible in the evening sky at the moment they're all in the morning sky and we'll talk about that in a minute but the brightest star overhead at the moment is called Sirius 
Right, okay. And Regulus, of course, is also a bright star. But if you think about modern culture, i.e. the Harry Potter universe, right? Yes. So you've got Sirius Black and you've also got Regulus Black. Regulus Arcturus Black. Arcturus is also a star. And he was a pure blood English wizard who was the father who was born to Orion and was the younger brother of Sirius Black. So you can see in modern culture that we're actually still using the stars. I mean, a lot of us would have learned Sirius as being the wishing star. Remember that little rhyme you might have learned, Starlight, Star Bright? Yes. First star that I see tonight? Yes. I yes. wish I may, I wish I might, that one? Yes, um, I so do. So it's a wishing star. Okay. Okay. And so, but in other cultures, it was a prime star for the Polynesians in navigating. Mm. So these bright stars have got their own meanings in different cultures, but also very practical things. When Sirius would rise over the Nile, that would be when the Nile would flood, so people would move to higher ground. So cultures have always looked at the stars, whatever the culture is, and given them a meaning related to what happens at the same time. Isn't it interesting? I mean, we have all this modern technology these days to do most things for us, not all. But in, back in ancient times, they used the natural parts of the world, the sky, the water, the, the earth, the seasons to read and understand what was going to happen and predict the things, you know, the weather and the rise and the fall of the water and all those sorts of things. They didn't need what we have now but we have such modern technology to be able to do all this stuff. And the intriguing thing is around the world, many stories are very related and very similar. So at the moment, setting in the, towards the West is um, the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, also known as Subaru to the Japanese, or it's also the emblem of the Subaru car if you ever look at it. The Seven Sisters is a story that is in every culture they have a story, from our Indigenous folks in Australia to the Intuit people to the ancients, to the Chinese, to the Indians. But you have a story of seven sisters, of seven maidens, of seven young women who are all being chased by somebody, in the case of the Greeks, Orion the hunter. You've got Bayami, the, the old father of the indigenous, of the Gamilroy and other people out here. He's falling over and his wives are a bit annoyed, apparently, because they tripped him because they thought he was chasing the seven girls. But you <laughs> always have somebody, some fellow, chasing these seven maidens. But here's the, here's the rub. For the last 10,000 years or so, there's only been six, six bright stars visible in the Pleiades. And where's the seventh? Well, the seventh sister, that's the question. So we, have some, we have a couple of Indigenous stories that actually talk about how the seventh sister, the missing sister, basically is the one who fell in love with the fellow and then went back down to earth to give up her space in the sky to live with him, which I actually like that story because it's sort <laughs> of, I like love stories with happy endings. <laughs> well, we but like it's intriguing how endings. we make how these stories come to be so everything everything obviously has a common ancestry they say the Australian Indigenous folks have been here for around 65,000 years or between at least 45,000 65,000 years having come across the land masses from Africa which obviously is where all the stories started but over time the stories evolved but we all have a story of these seven sisters do a search on stories of the seven sisters around the world it's, it's so worth doing just just from a purely anthropological point of view. That's Actually, my new word for the day, anthropological. I don't think I can say it right now. <laughs> I, I'm just going to put a challenge out there to anyone listening who, who listens to the replay or anything like that, to do a search on the Seven Sisters and find out for yourself what the, the real story is. And if you've got any comments, put some comments below the video that is happening right now curious to know what your thoughts are about the seven sisters in the sky and what happened to the seventh sister yeah let's uh, talk a little bit more donna about so let's talk about the morning sky because yes. you get up nice and early in the morning Faye. i do i do and that's where all the planets are hiding okay so where do you look for them because sometimes there's so much cloud around that you can't see anything particularly if you live here in coonabarabran at the moment well, there's lots of cloud out there now. It's looking out there. It's all cloudy out there as well. Yeah. So we're looking to the east. Yes. So basically the planets were known as wanderers. 
planetos. That's where the word planet comes from, the ancients. And they actually knew about Mercury, Venus, obviously Earth, because we live on it, which is the only one that's not named after a god, by the way. It's named after Terra, Earth, what we stand on, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. So they knew about these planets and they knew about them because they moved they were called wanderers. They appeared to move against the background stars. So they thought they were wandering stars. Right. So they didn't actually know they were planets. So we've just taken their name for it. So they've been known since the earliest of times. Mm. Isn't that sort of cool? Yeah. Well, because gonna... they could track their movements. That was, that's how, how amazing so many different cultures were. They actually tracked the movements of these. They saw that Mars and them appear to go backwards after a while and that's all to do because Mars takes twice as long to go around the sun as we do so in our appearance the way it appears across the sky it goes one way and then it starts to go what we call retrograde which all those astrology people like and since we're talking about astrology and astronomy next week I'll skip that for now but let's you know, talk about the planets in the morning yeah. sky where they are yes okay. where should so I look <laughs> let's start with Mercury okay because we'll start them in order because that's easiest so Mercury is in what we call superior conjunction okay so that means that Mercury and the Earth are on opposite sides of the sun. So if you imagine when Mercury and Earth are on the same sides of the sun, we call that inferior conjunction. These words superior and inferior just sort of sound bad because of our um, meanings for them. But it just means where they are in relation to the sun. Right. Okay? okay. So it's in the morning sky at the moment. So we're on the opposite side. So it looks a bit quieter. Right. So that happens actually on the 3rd of April, that actual event. And after it goes through these conjunctions, that's when it changes. So in the morning, in the moment it's in the very low eastern sky, but from the third, it will now start to head back to the western sky until it reaches its inferior conjunction, when it'll start to head back again to the northern, to the um, morning sky. So that's why these planets like Mercury and Venus are the morning and evening stars, because they go through as they travel around the sun depending on which side of the sun they are to us, whether they're in the morning sky or the evening sky. Mm, mm. So you've learned a new term called conjunction. Oh, I'm learning all sorts of things all of the time. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's not a really good time to actually find Mercury at the moment. By the end of the month, it'll only be three degrees above the horizon. So three degrees is kind of like if you hold out your fingers, right. your three fingers, right out at the out at the end of your arm that's how far above the horizon so you're going to have to have a really oh. perfect eastern horizon so people on the a western horizon so being on the west coast are probably okay yeah and, where they and can with, see the ocean with a telescope could you see it quite no it's it's actually better in binoculars right because okay. it's too low to the ground so telescopes sort of have an angle so you know you want to when you're like down like that it's really hard really hard to see okay yeah, so, so binoculars as professionals we rarely look below 30 degrees in the sky so we also avoid all that um nasty stuff called atmosphere all right okay so think about full moons new full moons and sunsets and sunrises right. as you sort of see them they look so much larger than when they were above us yeah i was looking and that's at an the effect of the atmosphere yeah it's not look, real looking at the moon this morning and it was sort of like just a half just a fraction you could see it through the cloud oh. yeah so it's in its phase at the moment um it's just gone through full moon it's heading towards new moon mm. Mm. which will be on april the um first i think which is not far away Only... no new moon's on april the first so it'll stay nice and dark at night until a couple of days after that then we get the lovely little crescent moon it's only, the first that's only a couple of days away it's yeah you know yeah. So, so, so Mercury is going to be a bit hard to see when it right. switches back to being the evening star. And that's because it can never rise. Mercury and Venus can never rise very far in that's the sky. Like Jupiter can be overhead, Saturn can be overhead, same with the others, but and Mars. But Mercury and Venus, because they're between us and the sun, can never get above a certain part of the sky, which is why Venus in particular is, is in many cultures, is seen as being tethered. So that because it can't rise. So you have an imaginary line, which is normally the zodiacal light represents that. Right. But it's to do with that. So Venus, of course, you cannot miss. Yes. Venus yes. is so bright. It's in um it's in Capricorn at the moment in the morning sky, for those right. who are interested in such things. It's also Capricorn? there sharing Capricorn with um Saturn and Mars. 
mm-hmm. above it um, moves into Aquarius later on in the month and then it gets which is actually quite handy because around the same time moves into Aquarius it's going to be quite close to Jupiter and Neptune and this is a really good opportunity to with a good pair of binoculars to try and find the eighth planet oh okay I've got some binoculars I'm gonna start using okay so um <laughs> follow my you know my blog will be coming out my my blog on what's on the month will be coming out and i'll have some finder charts in it oh good good. excellent so it'll be in my newsletter and my blog so it'll make it a bit easier for you to find beautiful so i think it's going to be pretty cool it's on the morning of the 28th right right now this isn't much good for any of our mates looking over for western australia because it won't be any good so about 5 10 a.m right that's when you're out yes right um, you've got to find Venus, right? Oh. Yeah, you know how to find Venus. It's the yes. brightest object in that part of the sky. Yeah. Okay. And, okay, see my little finger? Yes. My little finger represents half a degree. Right. Okay. Okay. So it's, that's how close it's going to be, Neptune to Venus, appear in the sky to Venus. So they're going to be so that that's close. Simply in, a, in, a, in, a, in, your, in your binocular field. That's what it'll, it'll be quite like. easy to find to put Venus in there, get it centered, and then it's going to be nearby and it'll look like a little blue dot. That's oh. your challenge. Oh, on the 28th of April. On the 28th at 5 10 a.m. Okay. All right. Challenge. And so anyone else out Venus, there right? can yeah. ch- be challenged to look for that. Okay. Right. And like I said, if they follow my find my Facebook, follow me on Facebook or get my newsletter. They'll get a map to tell them how to find it. Beautiful. Okay. Or actually, um, we also can you put the map Jupiter, up. which is we... also bright. Mm-hmm. So nearby to Venus around the end of the month as well. So Mars is the red one. Okay. In the sky. So we've got Ven- you know, we've, we've found, we know where Venus is, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So Mars is in the eastern sky. It's about, so six degrees. So about, f- you know, your fist size above Venus. Right. Right. Okay, so we're using some very thing. So this is holding them out called perspective. But okay, so hold your fist out and you will go above Venus and you should find Mars. Okay? Right. So you've got a lot of work to do in the mornings, a lot of morning homework. I'll just have okay, to take so my binoculars go while I'm walking. Okay, so yeah, just stop. You look like a real, you know, looking. Okay. All right. you know. <laughs> I look like You'll a nutcase. <laughs> yeah, you know that um, Netflix thing, don't look up, just ignore it. You've got to yes. look up. Okay. Oh, you've got to look up. Yeah. Yeah, always look up. Mm. Okay, so you've got that there. Um, the only, um, yep, yeah, so you find that, and then above that is a yellow, it, it, even above, further above Mars, is a yellowy star. And so these stars don't twinkle because they're not stars. Oh, yeah. Because they're well, reflecting they? the sunlight. They're planets. Yeah. yeah. So you've got the yellow object above Mars, just about three fingers above Mars, is Saturn. Right. So Saturn's the highest one, mm-hmm. then Mars, then Venus and Jupiter. Okay? Yeah. So you've got lots of times when they're going to be close to each other. Again, on the 13th, you might be able to try and find, might be a bit easier to try and find Neptune because it's going to be close to Jupiter. So the planets are having a dance this month. Right. They're dancing around swapping places. So once you identify them, we'll leave Mercury out because, like I said, Mercury is going to be a bit hard. But Saturn, Jupiter, Venus and Mars. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. Four amazing planets in there. And you get a couple of opportunities, like on the 13th, if you can find Jupiter in your binoculars. And, you know, I don't know, what size are your binoculars? I don't know. I so say to, about a 10 to... by 50 or something like that, which is pretty standard binocular. If yes. you can hold them steady, right? And you look yeah. at Jupiter, you can actually see it's mo- the four Galilean moons that Galileo saw, which is okay. Io, Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa. And just some more worthless trivia Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. It's bigger than our moon, it's even bigger than Mercury and Pluto. But it's so far away, it doesn't look bigger? No, it's very far away, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it is. It's the largest moon in the solar system. So those are the four little moons that if you can get your binoculars steady on something, on a tripod or just leaning on the fence, because a lot of us find it really hard to keep um, binoculars yeah. steady, Yeah, you can actually see the dance of, you can see Jupiter's moons as well in a decent pair of binoculars. And that's on the 13th? 
Oh, that's, um, I'm just saying the 13th because then you should be able to find um, Neptune as well because okay. Jupiter is not as bright at the moment as Venus is. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say there is so much information there, so much going on. I think I've put out a couple of challenges for people that are listening and maybe... Um, I have one what... more thing. You can't cut me off yet. Okay. There's a meteor shower. Okay, when's that? Yeah. There are two meteor showers this month. One is called the Lyrids, which is a northern hemisphere shower that we can't see. It's about the between it, it sort of goes between the 16th and the 25th, right? So you know meteors are what you all call shooting stars, which are of course shooting stars, they're just best bits of debris. Yeah. Okay, so the peak of this meteor shower is around the 20 the morning of the 22nd, 23rd. So you know your early morning things is really good because you want to get up before dawn and see these things. Yeah. So you can get quite good rates. So you are going to have the moon, the waning gibbous moon up in the sky. But um, if you've got a nice northern horizon, you should be able to see them. But the other one is the pie poopets, which sounds really good. So pie as in pie, you know, pie are square and all that stuff. Yes. And poopets is in the constellation of poopus, the poop of the ship, of the good <laughs> ship Argus. So they're a young southern shower. Um, they come from a comet called um, 26P Grig Scalarup. Like, seriously, <laughs> it's a complicated name. But you can see them from the 15th to the 28th, but the peak again is on the 24th. So you're sort of seeing 22nd, 23rd, 24th. Lots to see and do in the sky. Uh -huh. Okay. But when they, these um, meteors are really special because they're slow. Okay, which means so really instead of streaking, streak, 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 which you've got to catch, these ones can be quite spectacular. Yeah. Because they're slow moving across the sky. And, mm. and a lot of them are yellow and occasionally you get fireballs, which are really cool. Okay. So there's so, lots in April. There's so much to look at in the sky, in the night sky, and then before dawn in the morning. So, yep. you know, 5 a.m., and go out at 5 a.m. and just look at the sky and see what you can see uh, is absolutely fascinating. It creates a curiosity of, of wonderment, I suppose, at what, what you actually get to see and how when you're not used to looking at the sky and looking for what's in the sky at certain times, there's a, there's a challenge there. Yes. But an exciting challenge for, for people who want to actually learn more about the um, night sky and before dawn. Yeah. And the good, the good thing about the planets is you don't, need, you don't need binoculars to see them. You don't need a telescope. You can just need a night sky. A naked eye to the night sky. Yeah, and, and a just way, be and wary. It's, it's it's good if you've got like for people who live on the coast and near the water, you can look out over the horizon and they really stand out. And think about think about then just sort of put yourself back in the feet of the ancients of what they would have seen. Oh, just go down, stand by the beach and just yeah, look exactly. at the horizon and see what I can and, see. And you know what's really cool, Faye? That all around the world there are people at their time zones looking at the same things. Yeah. So we have, yeah. no matter what else is happening, all the nastiness that's happening in the world today between volcanoes in Manila, nastiness up in the Ukraine and all the stuff that's going on and all those other things, we can, we've can we all got the world, one of the sky in common. Yes, yes. And we, we can, have. wherever we are in the world, go out in the morning and look out and see those planets. And enjoy. And enjoy, enjoy and know that under it all, we're one world, we're one sky. Absolutely. That is absolutely fascinating. I, I think that we have so much to appreciate and so much to be grateful for and, you know, to learn about and, and have a respect for, for our planet Earth to start with and then what surrounds it or what we surround, you know, what surrounds us and, and be curious, become more curious about it and enjoy make your own stories up if you can't see the sickle and you can't see the lion i see an upside down question mark yeah i'm going to look i'll, I'll make your looking. own stories up <laughs> thank you donna and i look forward to next week's story and uh look forward to learning lots more about the night sky and particularly about april and what, all the things that are going on 
and maybe we can put up the map so that people can actually see if they're curious see what it is that's going to be in the sky particularly in April I'll send you my newsletter and you can take it all out of there thank you so much not a problem thank you so much Faith pleasure bye for now